I would like to welcome you to the first symposium of this economics uh, this year. This is what memory quirks, hiccups, and odd phenomena tell us. And I would like to welcome everyone who is joining us online as part of the first ever Psychonomics Live, uh, live broadcast. Uh, if you are on Psychonomics Live broadcast and you'd like to submit a question during today's symposium, click on the talk button, talk bubble, icon located in the lower right hand corner of your uh, appear. And when you do that, a pop-up box titled Ask a Question will appear. Type your question, including your name and email, then press the button marked Ask Question, and then um, I will uh, get those questions by email and ask the questions uh, uh, for you here, either uh, after each speaker's um, individual question session or if we have time at the end for a final uh, question session. So the The title of our symposium is What Metamary Quirks, Hiccups, and Odd Phenomena Tell Us. Uh, I'm Bennett Schwartz, and this is co-chaired by Zara Pena-Giolo and Anne Cleary. So our first speaker will be um, uh, Zara. Good morning. And I'd like to... Um, say, I was waiting if Bennett was going to say it, and since he didn't, um, this symposium was inspired by a um, book uh, on quirky memory effects edited by Bennett and Anne, and um, all of the speakers have a chapter in it. Um, it shows the sort of a surge of new interest in quirky phenomena, and uh, this talk actually is not in that chapter, but um, it, it, uh, the revelation effect has been uh, reviewed by Asvalg in, uh, in, in a different book called Cognitive Illusions rather than Memory Illusions. So um, paper is out there, not by me though. So um, I, I also would like to add that we have an additional author, Josh Katz, um, who joined the team after the submissions. So, um, what is revelation effect for those who are not um, all that familiar? Because it, it is an old and quirky effect. Uh, it's a memory illusion. And it's an illusion oh, I can, uh, where everything is studied normally, so no encoding differences. And the manipulation is at test, and the manipulation is that for some items, those test items have to be revealed in some way. They're initially distorted and have to be revealed in some way. And um, it can be any kind of task, as long as it's relevant. It, it doesn't even have to be the word itself. And the thing that it is an illusion is that it's true for both targets. It um, increases the amount of saying yes to both targets and lures. Okay, if I could only see my slides. Um, and obviously, with any quirky findings, there will be lots of explanations. And since the 1990s, there have been um, some. And these are the ones that are still in contention. And um, they just, um, they're in two different groups. One is those who try to explain, that try to explain revelation uh, through a memory perspective, and those that focus on a decision-making criteria perspective. So those are the familiarity increased ones, and um, the decision criteria change ones. Of course, it doesn't mean they're exclusive of each other, but, uh, and I will not um, go into any explanations in this talk, because I'm just going to present some empirical findings. Uh, the current verdict is, um, none of them can explain uh, the revelation effect in its entirety. And uh, so it's still quirky. So good enough for today's talk. And um, what today's talk will involve is the nature of the revelation task before 
the recognition decision. More specifically, it's whether um, the task leads to like an aha moment or uh, something mindful rather than, um, OK, done, next, so based on an algorithmic solution. So that segues into the aha literature, which is basically and mostly in problem solving. But um, there, the link to the memory part is that those problems that have been solved with an insight, insightful solutions, lead to better memory. So a possible connection to the revelation effect is that, in this case, if we talk about revelation, not just discovering what the task is, but uh, in the sense of an aha, probably less intense than aha, probably more like, oh, or huh, um, rather than just going, but some emotion involved in it. So it could be that that kind of emotion somehow might uh, trigger the extra familiarity or the criterion uh, change. Or um, subjects may be aware that if something um, may be aware intuitively of the problem solving uh, ideas that somehow if something is uh, revealed then you remember it better and then they can sort of make a connection that maybe if something is revealed then I must have studied it before. Um, that could be true uh, because we do know that uh, tip of the tongue phenomena hap happen more with more familiar items than unfamiliar items and they also might lead to aha moments more so. But it could also be inappropriate because um, just because you have an aha moment and then you remember it better does not equal the converse. And um, if it is inappropriate, then it's a shout out to the metacognitive illusion people of the belief um, that uh, it's an inappropriate belief that leads to the illusion. But it may not matter um, whether it's appropriate or inappropriate. If appropriate, they could be overusing. If inappropriate, that's an illusion. But any type of emotional um, reaction could, in fact, induce this revelation effect. So in our experiment, the first, um, basically subjects study a bunch of words, typical revelation effect study, and um, the recognition test on twice as many words, free choice recognition, and um, the revelation task is solving anagrams, and for that we have easy and hard anagrams, uh, as well as, um, of course, the normal. The ease has to do with deviation from the actual word, number of letter changes. And the reason we have easy and hard is because we thought that maybe harder ones would lead to sort of a more of an incubation and then lead to an aha effect. We were wrong, but um, that's what, why we have the easy and hards. And uh, we have 48 subjects. Uh, all, everything is within subjects. And the test procedure is Everything is the same as a standard revelation effect study. Um, when you see the word or the anagram, you either solve it or copy it and make a recognition decision. And we also included a confidence rating to look at meta memory. And this is the new part. But if you solve it, you indicate when the solution came you put a little check mark on one of the columns. Uh, they had 30 seconds to solve each anagram. And at the end, if they couldn't, there was a key. And the key actually varied, so they couldn't memorize the key. So they had to actually look and do the algorithmic th 
thing. And the results are, if they do that, you can see uh, everything is compared to the normal, that um, the anagram, when they solve it themselves without the use of the key, there is a revelation effect, healthy revelation effect. But if the key, if they get to the key and they have to use the key, it doesn't seem to uh, induce this yesness. So uh, what might be going on? Well, there are a lot of questions in this case. We don't know whether it's the aha or not, but it could be. It could also be um, that the key, by the time they get to the key, it's so difficult that they give up on trying to solve it and just um, put the words in the right places. And also, I should add that um, this is quirky. This is uh, what we have here is um, the loss of the effect with the key is um, driven strictly by the targets. In fact, with the targets, we have an anti-revelation effect where uh, people say yes more often to the normal words. One caveat is exactly what I just said. We have no idea. We assumed it could be due to the ahanas. So in experiment two, what we have are um, the same words, um, simplified, no more key condition. And uh, we increase the time to solve the anagram to 60 seconds. And um, no easy or difficult. Uh, it's just we took the easy anagrams because uh, apparently people can't solve anagrams. Not everyone can. Um, so he, the test procedure is also identical except for the last um, part that in, there is no key. So some of them are left blank. But um, indicate in the last column if the solution uh, came you indicate whether it came right away or later. But was it also accompanied by this ha huh, feeling? And here are the results for those. Uh, if you look at overall, regardless of whether they indicated aha or not, what you see is now we have an anti-revelation effect with the later solved items. The immediately solved uh, items are OK. There is a somewhat of a revelation effect. But if you combine the two, because they're both anagrams, you lose the revelation effect. Normal is no more yes prone than anagrams. If you look at only those that are accompanied by an aha judgment by the um, person, the effect is back when you combine them. What happens is that the later solved anagrams also increase in the same way as immediates do. But because of the initial anti-revelation effect, they can't cross the threshold over to a revelation effect, except when combined, now there is a revelation effect. So um, in the, um, the yellow. Um, highlights say, OK, we lose the revelation effect in overall. And if you actually do it just for the non-aha ones, it would be even worse because um, overall includes the aha responses. And then you get it back for those that were accompanied by an aha feeling. Uh, so what does it all mean? We don't know. <laughs> it's still quirky, but the ahanas seems to have some kind of an effect. Um, now, it could be, uh, it's not confounded with difficulty, because in the first experiment, it didn't matter whether the anagram was solved um, immediately or later. 
the effect was the same. We sort of assume that difficulty is, um, uh, should have caused um, an enhancement, maybe, if anything. Because there is conflicting results on the effect of difficulty as well, in that um, some studies find effort or difficulty does not um, play, uh, play a role in the magnitude of the revelation effect, and other studies show that it does. Uh, in any case, it seemed that um, maybe we're onto something that it is the emotional reaction during the revelation, revelation in its colloquial sense rather than uh, just finding out, is, has a role in the revelation effect. Um, so to f explore this further, we're going to replicate experiment two because we did not have enough power to look at whether in this case it was also driven by targets only and that lures didn't suffer. But we'll do this properly and uh, we'll include more subjects, but more importantly, we're going to have a revelation task that is not the word. Um, this is important because um, in, in Westerman Green's paper with a cool title of, what is it, the revelation uh, that the revelation effect is not, uh, do, does not have a role in revelation. Some, um, but that was revelation in the sense of just solving the task. Now, if you think of revelation as a ha huh moment, then maybe that does. So um, to get rid of that, uh, to, to see if the revelation is, has to be about the word, uh, we'll include extra list words as the revelation task. Also, we'd like to make insight somehow applicable to the memory rather than the anagram solution. Like, you say, oh, yes, that was there. It's not quite the aha moment. I can't see, sorry. <laughs> OK, one minute. Um, but to the memory itself. And one way of doing this might be, because you have the extra list thing, uh, after they discover the word, will they, uh, they can, we can ask them, did you have an aha moment for the memory? And maybe if we do it against the uh, RK judgments, recognize no judgments, then we can even tease them apart because one would expect our, uh, one does know that revelation effect is confined or much more pronounced with K responses than R responses, which predicts the other way around because one would expect an aha response to be linked more to the R responses than to the K responses. Uh, so, and we're open to other suggestions of how we might go about in pursuing this line, if it's worth pursuing. But anyway, here are some preliminary results of all of that. Um, and here are the references. And thank you. We have time for one question, one quick question. Get it. They're not relying on it as much. Yeah. They're not aware that they're relying on it. Um, 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, in fact, even if it is the same solution over and over again, they may use only part of the key, and when they get enough letters, they say, ah, yeah, that's the word. So in all those solutions, it's confounded, the key. In this case, the key was only very at the end. You're totally blanked. Yeah. Thank you, Zira. Our next speaker is Monica Undorf from the University of Mannheim. Okay, thank you. I will be talking about the font size illusion in metamemory and what we might learn from it about metamemory. And specifically, we will be focusing on the, meta on the font size illusion for non-words. So when we are discussing font size and metamemory, the basic question is whether people think that the very font size in which information is presented will affect their memory and learning. And in 2008, Rhodes and Castell con um, discovered the font size illusion and they indeed found that people rely on font size when making judgments of learning, that is when predicting their later memory for performance for recently studied information. In the studies done by Rhodes and Castell, participants studied words and some of the words were presented in a larger 48-point font and other words were presented in a smaller 18-point font. And then results revealed that their judgments of learning were higher for 48-point words than for 18-point words. However, this was an illusion because actual memory performance was unaffected by font size. And since 2008, more than 20 later studies have replicated and extended the font size illusion in metamemory. However, the font size illusion is not only robust but also of outstanding theoretical importance. One thing is that um, the font size illusion clearly shows that metamemory is inferential in nature. This means that people base their metamemory judgments on cues and heuristics rather than directly on their memory traces. In addition, the font size illusion is a very nice demonstration and one of the first demonstrations that metamemory judgments can rely on perceptual information. And finally, the font size illusion has proven to be informative of fluency contributions to metamemory in recent years. This means when investigating whether and to what extent metamemory relies on the fluency or ease with which people can encode information, then the font size illusion um, can be used to investigate this question. So, considering that the font size illusion is very robust and theoretically important, it was surprising to see that um, two relatively recent studies did not find a font size illusion for non-words. Please note that none of these studies actually focused on the font size illusion for non-words. They just happened to obtain judgments of learning for words printed in different font sizes. However, these studies found that font size did not affect judgments of learning for non-words. Here is um, some data from our experiment. We manipulated font size in four different discrete levels, ranging from 9-point font to 294-point. And um, you see that for words, we see the usual font size illusion, meaning that JOLs increased with increasing font size. For non-words, however, there was no effect of font size on judgments of learning. Okay, while the potential absence of a font size illusion with non-words may or may not question the theoretical conclusions drawn based on the font size illusion, this clearly offers a great chance to learn more about metamemory. First, maybe we can learn something new about the basis of the font size illusion if we investigate whether there is or is no font size illusion for non-words. Even though the font size illusion is such a prominent metamemory illusion, relatively little is known about its basis. And finally, um, the lack of a font size illusion for non-words might point to a crucial limitation in metamemory research. In metamemory, we often use word stimuli in order to test our theories that extend well beyond word stimuli. And showing that the font size illusion may not be there for non-words might indicate that this generalization may not be always appropriate. And this is why we started to investigate the font size illusion for non-words, and I will be reporting our experiments today in this talk. So, um, the first experiment aimed to replicate um, the font size illusion or the lack of the font size illusion for non-words 
or put differently, tested whether the font size illusion might be restricted to word stimuli. In the experiment, we used three different item types. First, participants studied words. Also, they studied pseudo-words. These pseudo-words are non-words that are pronounceable. That is, they could be proper English words. They just happen not to be it. And then there are true non-words that, that are very difficult to pronounce. We also used four font sizes. The smallest font size was 9 point. Then there was a larger font size, 29 point font, um, 93 point font. And we used a relatively large 294 point font. So here's the procedure. Participants studied each word. They made a JOL for each word. That is, they predicted the chances of remembering the specific word in the later free recall test. And in the end of the study, they indeed completed a free recall test. So here are the results that we found for judgments of learning. You can see that um, judgments of learning for words increased with increasing font size. That is, we found a font size illusion for words. Um, however, we also found a font size illusion for pseudo words. That is, judgments of learning for pseudo words also increased with increasing font size. Replicating the two prior studies that obtained judgments of learning for non-words printed in different sizes, we did not, however, find a font size illusion um, for non-words. There is no linear increase in judgments of learning with increasing font sizes. In addition, you can see that people made much higher judgments of learning for words than for pseudo-words and higher judgments of learning for pseudo-words than for non-words. Here you see the actual recall performance and you see that participants accurately predicted that they would remember words better than pseudo-words and pseudo-words better than non-words. However, we did not find a font size effect on recall performance, again showing that this is in fact a meta-memory illusion. So, although we replicated the absence of a font size illusion with non-words and um, the presence of, the, of a font size illusion for words, the finding of a font size illusion with pseudo words does not fit the idea that the font size illusion may be restricted to words. So, what is going on? Why don't we find a font size illusion for non words? One idea is that maybe item type overshadowed font size. Here, the idea is that the words are so much easier to learn or appear so much easier to learn than the difficult non-words that participants felt that the slight differences in memorability based on font size did not make much of a difference. If this is true, then we should find no font size illusion for non-words whenever participants study lists that contain non-words and words, because here the contrast between the easy words and the very hard non-words is high. However, we should find a font size illusion for non-words when study lists comprise non-words and pseudo-words, which are much more similar in perceived difficulty. So we tested this idea in experiment two, where we had two between subjects group. The first one, we, ref we refer to it um, as to the high contrast group. And here the study list consisted of words and non-words. And the prediction was that if the lack of a font size illusion for non-words is due to overshadowing, then we should find no font size illusion for non-words in this condition. In the low contrast group, the study list consisted of pseudo-words and non-words, no words in the study list. And the idea was that um, here we should find a font size illusion for non-words and of course also for pseudo-words. Here are the results. In the high contrast group, we replicated the font size illusion for words, but um, to our surprise, we also found a font size illusion for non-words. And this is what we would not have expected if overshadowing takes place. Here are the results from the low contrast group and they conform closely to expectations, font size illusion for pseudo words and also a font size illusion for non words. So overall, the finding that there was an effect, a font size illusion for, for non words in both conditions does not fit with the idea that item type overshadowed font size and that this was re responsible for the lack of a font size illusion for non-words in our first experiment and in the previous experiments. So what's going on? What is the crucial difference between experiment one in, where we did not find a font size illusion for non-words and experiment two where we found a font size illusion for non-words? 
One idea was that maybe if the study lists include only a relatively low number of very challenging non-words, then people just don't bother to study these words. They don't even try to master these words, but just skip the non-words. Um, so, and if this was the case, then we should not find a font size illusion for non-words whenever there are relatively few non-words in the study list, and it seems like an okay strategy to skip these items. However, if the majority of items are non-words, then it might feel very bad to skip most of the study items, and then participants might try to master the non-words, which in turn would result in a font size illusion for non-words. And this is what we tested in our third and last experiment. We again compared two groups. Um, in the few non-words group, the study list um, included 24 words and only eight non-words. That was the same proportion as in experiment one, only that there were also pseudo-words in experiment one. And here the idea is, if the lack of a font size illusion for non-words is due to participants skipping the non-words, then we should not find a font size illusion in this condition. In the many non-words condition, participants um, studied only eight words and all the rest of the items, 24, were non-words. And here the idea was, was that participants would feel obliged to study the non-words, at least to try studying the non-words, which should then result in a font size illusion for non-words. So here you see the results. When there were only very few non-words in the study lists, we found a font size illusion for the words. And we also found a small but significant font size illusion for non-words. Importantly, however, the font size illusion for non-words was much more pronounced in the many non-words group. And this interaction between font size and um, condition fits very well with the idea that learners skip a small proportion of very challenging non-words um, if the majority of items is easier to learn. So does this make sense? Yes, it does make sense. Um, first of all, the idea is that learners skip a small proportion of very challenging items is perfectly consistent with several important theories of um, metacognitive effort regulation and study time allocation. Um, and secondly, this finding fits nicely with the research on judgment of learning reactivity where it is shown over and over again that the very fact that participants make JOLs makes them focus on the relatively easy items on the list. More broadly, um, yes, we have indeed learned something new about the font size illusion from investigating the font size illusion for non-words. And what we have learned is that um, the fact that participants try to master items seems to be a prerequisite of finding a font size illusion. However, our results clearly argue against the idea that maybe findings obtained for words may not generalize to non-word um, materials. Also, um, our findings um, on the font size illusion for non-words are perfectly consistent with using the font size um, illusion um, to demonstrate that metamemory is inferential in nature, that metamemory is based on perceptual information, and that the font size illusion can be used to inform research on the interplay between um, fluency and beliefs to metamemory. So, thank you very much. We, we have time for questions, um, but we need people who are asking questions to go up to the microphones. Um, since we're being live streamed, uh, we need to, they need to be able to hear that. So if you have a question, please go to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Monica, you mentioned that you don't think that people are trying to learn these non-words and that they're just sort of phoning it in on those. Did you look at any measures of gamma or ROC to see if there's actually any evidence um, that they're making these judgments, that the judgments have any predictive uh, validity? Because if they're just phoning them in, you'd think that those would be uh, really non-predictive judgments of learning. The problem is that we are finding a flaw effect with non-words in each and every experiment, although we reduced the number of items as compared to the previous study so as to give people a chance to succeed with the non-words. So, and I think that this makes um, the whole issue more complicated. So participants, whether they try or not, they are actually correct in predicting 
would be correct in predicting that they have no chance to, to remember these items. But this is a good suggestion and I will look into that again. Thank you. Uh, hey there. So, um, do you think that the illusion could actually be replicated, like uh, generalized into um, non-letter uh, stimuli? So, for example, if it's an issue of, of categorization, do you think that if you could use um, uh, pictures of animals, for example, and then you like increase the size or decrease the size, people would think that they learned that particular type? So that elephants are easier to learn than mice or something like that? Yeah. Uh, so something like that. So uh, what I'm saying is, do you think that it's specifically about the font size or do you think yeah. it's a size issue? If it's a size, then it could be generalized into other things other than just um, letters that are kind of scrambled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this touches upon the, th the thing that we are not absolutely sure about the basis of the font size illusion. One possibility is, I mean, one possibility is you just see it and it seems so huge and you're sh sure that you will remember it. This would be a perceptual fluency explanation and this could generalize to very different stimuli. However, another idea is that people just have the explicit idea that large that words printed in large fonts are easier to remember. And if this is true, then the specific nature of the belief is essential to whether or not it should generalize. Particularly if people think that maybe um, correctly think that usually large font um, information is more important than small font information, then this might be narrowly tied to using like letter stimuli. And I think we have to look to, I mean, we can, you can just try out what happens, but in order to make good predictions, we should first clarify the basis of the font size illusion in meta memory. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. More, more questions? So, just to follow up on your last point. Um, when in the real world, when we see font, when we're reading, and someone prints font in large capital letters, like psychonomic society is more important to remember than advancing <laughs> cognition, right? So we have rules of communication. And I'm wondering if the font size solution is related to us implicitly following the rules that, we're, that this is more important. Yeah. Anyway, if that's so, then we might be able to just tell people that things that are printed in blue are more important than things that are printed in red and get a red-blue illusion, which we could reverse. And I mean, so I'm wondering if that's sort of what you, what you were referring to um, as far as the importance of things. So, I mean, there is beautiful work on telling participants what to learn of um, colors by Müller and Donlowski, and they told people that blue words are easier to process than green words, or vice versa, and this had a major effect on their meta-memory judgments. So, this might really work, but at the same time, me saying that font size does not affect memory is only half true, because if you use very extreme font sizes, very, very tiny things that are really difficult to read, and very, very large fonts, then we actually see that memory um, follows a U-shaped curve with better memory performance for very, very small and very, very large fonts. Right. So in the end, people might be absolutely correct in predicting that font size has an effect. They just do not get that we are in a range where it does not affect memory and this is somehow like people are not fully understanding our paradigms and I think that it's yeah. hard to blame them for this. Yeah, if you were able to, um, if you were able to add some physiological measure like ERPs, you might be able to detect a differential um, effort that they're putting into it that maps into their yeah. metacognitive yeah. judgment. Yeah. Anyway, it was a very interesting yeah. talk. Thank you. Thank you. This is an interesting suggestion. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. In one minute, our next speaker will be Steve Smith from Texas A&M. Uh,
Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was never a minute. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this symposium. I think I was invited because I had a title that rhymed, uh, and the title simply means that uh, if you have a memory theory that can't account for some of the t kinds of memory quirks that we're talking about, then the theory still needs some work. Uh, I was standing in the line at the checkout counter at Whole Foods. This was uh, several years ago when I was doing a sabbatical at UCLA, and the guy in front of me looked really familiar. He was short, like me. Uh, he was uh, a little younger than me, and I thought, is this guy, where do I know this guy? I know I've met him. He looks really familiar. Did I meet him in the psychology department? Did I see him at the gym in the student rec center? I couldn't think of it. Went home, went to bed, got up the next day walking down the street, and it suddenly came to me, oh, that's who that guy was, Sean Pence. So um, I'm going to be talking about the memory quirks of uh, memory blocks, but uh, I'm really more interested in the recovery from memory blocks when we resolve those memory blocks that were stymieing us in the first place. So I think that these are interesting memory quirks, and uh, for me it's this unexpected resolution of those memory blocks that interested me in the first place, and the reason is that I think that those memory blocks and recovery from them, I think, uh, tell us something about um, insight in creative problem solving. So that's the basic thesis of uh, what I'm going to be talking about here. In problem solving, in insight problem solving, you start with a problem, you reach some point of fixation, uh, there's some incubation time it's called, and then it's resolved when there's a sudden insight at the end of the incubation period. And, these problems, if it's a problem you solve immediately, it's not a candidate for this. If it's a problem you will never so solve ever, it's not a candidate for this. These are tractable problems that you can't get at first, and that's why the uh, implicit fixation is important, I think, in these cases. And it's parallel to the memory block and recovery situation where you have a memory cue, you have the memory block, spend some time, and then the memory is recovered. So I want to talk about a little bit of research that I've done on this subject. Uh, well, so, so what's the mechanism? Uh, you've got this problem, an implicit fixation. What happens during that incubation time? Some magical thing, possibly. Uh, some kind of autonomous unfolding process, unconscious work that goes on. Uh, and I would just like to say, if you know of any actual evidence for this, I would be delighted to see this, but it's a great story. Uh, you might be exposed to hints during the incubation or so-called incubation period. Maybe I was in Westwood, maybe there was a poster of Sean Penn or a theater or something like that that could have exposed me to a hint. But I'm looking at a little bit different situation. Wrong button, there we go. Um, a different situation that I'm referring to is the forgetting fixation hypothesis. The idea is that what's blocking the memory weakens over time, all right? And what's blocking problem solving weakens over time with forgetting. And in the, in the forgetting fixation theory, what the time provides, oops, wrong button again. What the time provides is some time to forget what was blocking the memory in the first, day, first place. So it could be decay of those fixating responses, a temporal context change in either case uh, the insight arises when the block is now weakened. So the way that we tested this originally uh, with one of my grad students um, was to expose people to fixating responses. We call these red herrings now uh, because we've got our subjects chasing after red herrings. We used to call them blockers until uh, Cornell and Metcalf had right in their title, blockers do not block. So Red herrings are meant to block, uh, but we don't know if they do or not, so we don't want to imply a mechanism. So red herring sounds good anyway. Uh, so in, we, we first exposed people to these red herrings, and 
here's an example for a remote associates test problem. In the remote associates test, you get three words. You have to think of a single word that is connected or associated with each of the three. And uh, so for the red herrings, we, associate, we have people form paired associates, luck and fortune, belly and fat, pie and chart. Then we give them the remote associates test problem, luck, belly, pie, and they have a tough time solving it. And we think it's because they are first retrieving these red herrings that we fed them in the first place. In uh, this study, it shows where we um, gave people, these were remote associate test problems. After they failed, we retested them either immediately or after a delay. And what we find is they do better after a delay, but only in the case where we first gave them those red herrings in the first place, only in the fixation condition, do we get a significant incubation effect. And before this, most people did not find incubation effects. We found this. Uh, again, in, in, uh, actually not again, this is previously in another study, we also tested memory for those red herrings. And as the memory for the red herrings decreases over time, the incubation effect increases over time. So we think that there's a connection there. Uh, and this is consistent with the forgetting fixation hypothesis. So my part one conclusion is that this experimented fixation can cause incubation effects, can lead to incubation effects if you give it time to wear off. The second quirk I want to talk about is context-dependent forgetting. Context-dependent memory refers to the idea that places where you are, environmental context, become associated with the events. Later on, when you're in that context, it reminds you of the events. Of course, if you are away from those contexts, that means those events or those memories will not come to mind. So we wanted to look at context-dependent forgetting to get people to forget these fixating uh, stimuli, these red herrings that we fed them, because we think in a change context, those red herrings will not come to mind as, as well. So uh, here's an interesting, some interesting quirks. If you look historically at some historic insights that people like to talk about, we've got, uh, oops. Boy, we've got to change these buttons here. We've, we've got uh, Archimedes discovers the displacement principle when he's taking a bath, not when he's sitting over his laptop computer. We've got George de Mistral, who invents Velcro, taking a hike with his dog. Poincaré, who discovers the fuchsian functions or something about them, stepping onto a bus. James Crocker, who figures out how to repair the Hubble Space Telescope while taking a shower. Einstein thinking about relativity while he's on a bus, Kerry Mullis discovering the, the uh, polymerase chain reaction when he's out for a drive in the northern hills of California. These people make a big deal. Well, they weren't even working on the problem at the time. The deal that's interesting to me is these all occurred in context, in places away from the workplace. Well, why is, why is that important? Well, uh, it's possible that insight is enhanced this incubation effect is enhanced when problems are reconsidered away from those fixating contexts. Maybe, uh, here's Archimedes here, he's, he's at work and he's, he's uh, thinking about all this stuff that you usually think about when you're measuring gold crowns and trying to figure out their volume. And then when he's away from the workplace, uh, now he gets the idea for the displacement principle. So maybe it's that change of context that's important. Uh, and so earlier I mentioned, well, maybe what's going on in this incubation time is some temporal context change. Well, maybe that would also work with a stimulus context change. So uh, the question that uh, my grad student, Jolt Betta, and I uh, looked at in uh, some, a recent paper, we asked, is fixation in creative problem solving context dependent? We uh, first gave people, come on buttons, there we go. We, we first had people encode red herrings in, the red herrings were shown over a photograph of some place. So they get fortune, fat, and chart, uh, which they encode. They ha then have to practice several times. They'll see the photograph on a trial. They have to remember the three words. They get a few trials of that. Then we say, okay, now for something completely different. Uh, now for the remote associates test, there's gonna be three words. 
pie, luck, and belly, and it occurs on the fixation context or it occurs in a new context. And of course the answer to this problem is not fortune or fat or chart, it's pot, pot pie, pot luck, and pot belly. But we find that when we reinstate the fixation context, we get a bigger blocking effect than we do if we test in a new context. So we now see that, uh, and, and here's the result, if we reinstate the fixation context, we get a, a nice healthy blocking or fixation effect relative to the unprimed condition. If you test in a new context, they didn't do significantly worse. So the new context does seem to help people get over fixation effects to some degree. And in an incubation study, we did the same thing, but uh, we had the initial test always in the fixation context. The second test, which was after a delay, either immediate or delayed, was done either in a new context or in the fixation context. And what we found were incubation effects, that is, people do better in the delayed retest than the immediate, and a much bigger incubation effect if they were tested in a new context, and these are the results of two different experiments, tested in a new context versus retested in the fixation context. So uh, is recovery from experiment, excuse me, the, the re, let's go back a minute, is the recovery, go back, there we go, is incubation context dependent? Yes, we think so. Does this work with implicit memory tests? That was the next question we asked. So we have an experiment-induced implicit memory block manipulation. We wanted to know was that context, excuse me, was that uh, also context dependent? If you show people the word analogy mixed in with some other words and later they get a word fragment for a word that looks orthographically similar, they do lousy on that. Uh, the solution here is allergy. And so we get an implicit memory blocking effect. So using the same paradigm, if they encode red herrings that look like the answer, then they get an initial test, we get our big uh, blocking effect, then when we do a retest, either immediately or delayed on this word fragment completion test, we can, get, we can look for the same incubation effect that we got with remote associates, and in fact, we got the same effect. So we get an incubation effect, better recovery after a delay in this implicit memory test, and better if they were tested in a new context. Uh, the conclusions from these studies and some others are that memory blocks and context-dependent forgetting are some memory quirks that can tell us something about creative problem solving. In new contexts, fixation is forgotten, or it's weakened at least, we think, and incubation is thereby enhanced, and weakened implicit fixation might liberate people from uh, their fixation and, and allow creative insights better. And I thank you very much for coming. We, we have lots of time for questions. Questions, please use the microphone. They're not fighting over the microphone. Okay, if we have no questions, oh, question, can you please go to the microphone? It's not, it's not really a question, but uh, this, this big phenomenon of space learning versus mass learning really reminds me of this context change, right? That what happens is when you do the space learning instead of you know, cramming just before an exam, Every time you restudy, you, you approach the same material with a new mindset, and the earlier blocks are relieved, things like this. So probably at one point, these two literatures might also nicely connect. Beautiful. <laughs> That's it. Yes, I, I, I agree that the literature that looks at what's called temporal context, so in spacing of repetitions, for example, uh, one way that it's explained is, is looking at temporal context effects. So uh, Jeff Karpicki's theory is an example of that. Does that work with other kinds of context, like these photographs that I used in my studies? Uh, 
wait for one of my students' dissertations and hold that thought. We'll get there. Thank you. Okay, so kind of tying what Monica talked about with um, meta memory illusions with what you're doing. So people can't predict insight and they can't generally recognize that fixating information is going to harm them. Do you think that people would be aware that incubation would benefit their performance on the remote associates task? Yes, I, I think people are well aware of this. Anyone who does crossword puzzles or those kinds of puzzles knows when you get, scu get stuck, go take a walk, go do something else and come back to it. So I, I think it's pretty common knowledge that uh, people should do that, that it works. Hi. Um, so would you say that this has implications on the types of activities that would best benefit incubation? Such? Yes, absolutely. You should go on sabbatical. You should go <laughs> to the beach. Go somewhere else. Okay. But take your troubles with you. Just keep thinking about them. So it'll ruin your vacation, but it'll <laughs> provide insights. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a short uh, four-minute break before our next speaker. Okay, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Akira O'Connor from the University of St. Andrews. Okay, you can hear me now. Fantastic. Um, thank you to the uh, Symposium Organizing Committee for inviting us to present in this symposium. I'm going to be presenting some work that has been done by uh, student Courtney Aitken in my lab. Um, as part of her training, she is currently seconded to the Scottish Government. And given the state of democracy in the UK at the moment, uh, she has her hands full, and so I'm here presenting her work. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, déjà vu, um, a strange, inappropriate sensation of familiarity. And I'm particularly interested in, in how we, when we experience it, we speak to researchers about it. Now, researchers like me are particularly interested in it because during deja vu, the normally kind of synchronized moving parts of our memory and consciousness become desynchronized, allowing us to get a peek into these individual components and how they might fit together. Now, um, it's really nice to be here in Montreal talking about this, as one of my scientific heroes, Wilder Penfield, uh, did some work on this sort of investigation uh, in, uh, well, using brain stimulation. So Penfield would stimulate um, small areas of uh, his patients' brains, and he would uh, record their, uh, their verbal accounts of what they were experiencing, such as, I had a flash of familiar memory, but I do not know what it was. So in this way, uh, Penfield was using the immediate accounts of um, people's experiences to, to better understand this interaction between memory, sensation, and consciousness, and how they were all inter integrated together. Now, déjà vu researchers have uh, tried to do the same thing uh, by asking the general population about their experiences of déjà vu. And this makes a lot of sense, given that most people have Deja vu, but where it starts to break down a little bit is that most people have deja vu about once a month to once a year. So we move away from immediate reports of uh, an interesting subjective experience to uh, retrospective reports that have an average lag of between two weeks and six months. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because we've learned a great deal about déjà vu from retrospective reports. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, déjà vu occurrence, its, its frequency of occurrence, its, its intensity, peaks in early adulthood uh, and the late teens before uh, declining into middle age. Uh, we also know some uh, demographic uh, issues affect 
deja vu. So we know that people who travel more, those with higher levels of education, uh, those who are tired, so many of the graduate students in, in this room, uh, will be more likely to experience uh, deja vu than others. So um, these findings, though, they're all largely based on retrospective reports. And we know from looking at a range of literatures where retrospective reports are used and then questioned that there are some issues that affect retrospective reports reliably. So what are these issues? Well, um, the first is underreporting. Um, health psychologists have found that um, we retrospectively underestimate the frequency of infrequent events. So things that don't happen very often, we say they happen less than they actually do. There's also um, overrating. So we tend to overestimate or exaggerate the properties of retrospectively reported events when we compare um, those retrospective reports to uh, reports of the experience that are given during the event or immediately after the event. There's also inconsistency over time. We all know about this. The further away from uh, an event we get, the less reliable our memory of it becomes, and that, but that's not always associated with a uh, decline in confidence associated with those memories too. So our work sought to answer whether these issues also affect retrospective reporting of deja vu. So the, this talk isn't really about deja vu as much as what we remember about our experiences of deja vu and how those might change based on the way in which we typically interrogate those experiences. So our study was an online questionnaire in which we first asked for a baseline report of people's experiences. Now we could have done this by um, asking about people's previous sort of last experience that they had, but we chose to ask about the properties of a typical deja vu experience. Uh, we then gave participants a link, uh, a web link to follow as soon as they had their next deja vu experience. So this could be anything from hours to weeks and months after this initial uh, typical questionnaire report. When they had their deja vu, they followed that link and they gave us an immediate report covering exactly the same properties we would asked about in their typical uh, deja vu report. Uh, but about the experience that they just had. Two weeks later, we emailed them with another link to provide a two-week retrospective rating of that uh, immediately reported experience. And then six weeks after the initial experience, we did the same, giving us um, up to six weeks of retrospective reporting on uh, the immediate event. So these various components of the, um, of the experiment come together to allow us to look at underreporting and overrating by comparing typical to immediate reports and inconsistency by examining how, um, how those retrospective reports um, alter um, any properties that might have been given in the immediate report. So given the staged nature of this data collection over, uh, in, in most cases, many months, um, it won't surprise you that there was a, a great deal of attrition in our sample. Um, so we started off with 175 participants, but that drops down to 29, and then 17, and then 13. Um, so this is a, an ongoing study. I'm presenting a, a work in progress. Um, and there is a, a slow but steady trickle of, of more retrospective uh, and immediate reports coming in. So with any luck, um, I'll be able to look at this data uh, more comprehensively soon. But for now, uh, for the first two, um, two analyses I'm going to present, we're looking at data from 29 participants. And for the last analysis I'm looking at, I'm going to present data from 17 participants. And we've shelved analysis of that uh, six-week follow-up group until um, we have more to go on. Okay, so I'll now talk you through uh, analyses of those potential issues uh, one by one. The first being uh, underreporting. So to investigate underreporting, we um, 
we compared uh, uh, responses to a question that we asked alongside the typical reports of when was the last time you had deja vu, and we compared that to the lag between completing that typical experience report and then giving us their immediate report. And we'd expect asymmetry in these two, uh, in these two lags uh, to indicate that maybe the retrospective reports are prone to some sort of memory distortion because we know that the immediate reports are given immediately after uh, the deja vu. We, we make sure that participants don't register a report if they've gone more than four hours uh, since experiencing the deja vu. Retrospective reports were positively skewed, as you would expect, given that we have uh, a mean participant age of 25 years. Retrospective reports were slightly more positively skewed, uh, but there's no statistical difference between these reports. So on a group level, we've no evidence that retrospective deja vu underreporting exists in this sample when we're comparing typical experiences, uh, when, we're, when, we're repair, when we're comparing reports solicited during typical experience questioning and the, uh, the lag to the next deja vu experience occurring. Okay. So as far as overrating goes, um, here I'm presenting uh, six different uh, properties of deja vu that we asked about. Now, I'm not particularly interested in the specifics of these properties, more in how these properties change in aggregate over, um, over typical versus uh, immediate reports. So that's reflected in uh, the statistic I'm going to show you uh, to summarize any, any differences, which is a Fisher's combined probability test, which looks at the, um, the overall trends. So uh, here we see uh, the typical reports, and here we see uh, ratings given after uh, immediate deja vu reports. And you can see that two of these ratings are significantly different from each other, but overall there does appear to be a trend across all of the ratings um, that um, immediate reports are rated as, as um, less, uh, well, they're, they're rated lower on all of these uh, dimensions than, uh, than typical reports. Now, this tendency is borne out in the combined probability statistic, and it suggests that overall there does appear to be evidence of over-reporting uh, of uh, the characteristics, the properties of deja vu um, during the, um, when, when, you're, when you're kind of idealizing your deja vu experience as opposed to when you actually experience it. Okay. So finally, I'm going to talk about inconsistency. Inconsistency between the immediate ratings and the retrospectively given two-week rating. So here are the immediate ratings, and here are the ratings after a two-week delay, and there doesn't appear to be anything going on here. So there's no evidence of inconsistency, inconsistency over time, in, at least in this very limited sample. But intriguingly, it does set up a possibility just by thinking about this, that, that there, may be, uh, there, there may be a tendency for people whose immediate ratings differ most from their typical ratings to show a kind of rebound back towards uh, that typical rating as they look at their deja vu experience retrospectively. Um, this kind of typicalization of the experience over time. So we chose to look at that. Um, using a series of, of uh, correlations. So on, uh, on this scatter plot, I've got two differences that I'm going to plot. On the x-axis, we have um, the difference between immediate and typical reports as immediate minus typical ratings. And given the pattern of uh, responses across our data, uh, we would expect the, the kind of points to primarily be on the right-hand side of the scatter plot. On the y-axis, we have uh, retrospective drift, um, which is two-week minus uh, immediate reports. And we'd expect, based on the fact that four of our six ratings were, um, were uh, 
that showed that, that sort of drift, um, we would expect those perhaps to be up here, meaning that if we do see um, evidence of uh, typicalization, then we should see these points kind of clustered there um, with positive correlations. And as I step through uh, showing uh, these, these ratings, you'll see that overall we have six positive correlations. Three of them have correlation coefficients over 0.49. So there does appear to be uh, a kind of typicalization of ratings. That it suggests that uh, retrospective reports might start, start to converge on typical ratings. Uh, and that's borne out in the, um, in the combined probability statistic as well. Okay, so as far as what we've found, at the group level, we see no evidence of retrospective underreporting. Under Properties of deja vu do appear to be overrated uh, when typical uh, reports are compared to single instances. And whilst there's no evidence of retrospective inconsistency on a group level, um, individual analyses suggest that there might be a link between retrospective drift and overrating. Now, um, given that we've thought about a number of problems relating to this study. I'm going to finish by talking about a couple of things that are, um, are potentially very important to get right in this sort of research. Uh, sample bias, we're dealing with an interesting uh, sensation and people who are interested in it tend to participate in the research. And we whittle them down over weeks uh, with attrition and, and uh, the retrospective study. So what I'm proposing is that it would be wonderful um, to transition from this sort of research to using the sorts of ubiquitous mobile technology that we all carry on us, um, which seem almost designed to uh, help with this sort of research. We can integrate, potentially, um, collection of this sort of data into uh, health or journaling apps. Um, we can transition to entirely prospective reporting and we can potentially even look at rich sensor data to make sense of uh, some of the retrospective findings that we know about. So sensor data associated with sleep, with mood, um, with uh, GPS location, and so on. But that's something for the future. If, if you're a, a web uh, or an app developer and you would like to work on that, do let, let me know. I'd be very interested in speaking to you about that. But for now, hopefully I've communicated to you that um, deja vu retrospective reports are not as problematic as they could be. Uh, there are still some interesting quirks in there that make it um, worth investigating scientifically. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Please go to the microphones to ask your questions. Do you think there can be a self-testing effect when you um, test them over those couple of weeks? There may well be, yes. Um, as soon as we get people uh, reporting these things, yes. I, I think that there's the potential for that. that, it, that there's probably very clever ways of designing studies to, to vary that and to, to look at the differences and the, the changes. Um, but yes, yeah, that, that, that's definitely an issue. Hi, yeah. Um, I just wondered if you send any people like reminder emails or you just let them leave the study. <laughs> um, so uh, about the... About After they'd done the first rating yeah. and then they had to, when they had their first immediate next yeah. deja vu, yeah. Whether if they didn't respond within six weeks, you prompted them? Yeah, we, we, um, we remind them that they are continuing to participate in the study. They, they can follow this link to, uh, to um, register any experiences they have. But yeah, we also emphasize that we do want immediate experiences. Um, we also then automate all of the two-week and six-week ret retrospective reminders um, 
so, and, and exclude people that go beyond certain boundaries of, of those time periods as well, which do, doesn't really help with the attrition, but hopefully keeps the data as <laughs> within, the, within the bounds that we want it to be in. Is, is there something unique about the deja vu experience here with respect to these retrospective reports? Would you see similar patterns with the, the blocking, the butcher on the bus that uh, Steve Smith was talking about, or a tip of the tongue state? Yeah, I, I would suspect that you would, um, well, perhaps, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, the, the reason I, I kind of changed direction mid-answer was that, that people seem to carry a lot of baggage with them about deja vu experiences relative to other, um, other phenomena that, that they experience but, but don't have such, such strong opinions on in terms of what causes it or, or why it's so weird. And I get a lot of emails about that sort of stuff, but I don't get a lot of emails about I don't know, confidence, confidence ratings or uh, uh, ROCs or anything like that. But, but um, yeah, I, I suspect that any difference that you see is evident in how people rate the, the typical experience. So it, it may be exaggerated uh, compared to some of these other, um, other sensations, but it wouldn't surprise me if that, that kind of tendency towards typicalization, if that exists in deja vu, is also present in these other sensations. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, our penultimate speaker, will be Ann Cleary uh, from Colorado State University. In my lab, our study of the deja vu phenomenon over the years has led us to discover a potential role of familiarity in future-oriented cognitive bias. Most of you are probably familiar with the deja vu phenomenon. It's basically a feeling of having experienced a current situation before despite realizing that it's actually new. So maybe you're visiting the Louvre for the very first time in Paris and you're overcome with this sensation of having been to that spot before despite realizing this is your first trip to Paris and you've never actually been here before. What you may not be aware of is that there is a peculiar relationship between deja vu and feelings of premonition. And this may relate to the idea that our memories orient us toward the future. So basically, our memories are adaptive or useful to us, not so much because they enable us to consciously recollect the past, but because they enable us to, to predict and navigate our futures. And a lot of the research in this realm has come out of uh, Dan Schachter's lab by Dan Schachter and colleagues. This idea that memory orients us toward the future is not limited to conscious recollective ability, but includes quirky aspects of memory like deja vu. So this peculiar relationship between deja vu and feelings of premonition is apparent from a number of different sources. Uh, one of the ways it has become apparent is through survey reports of participants, uh, of retrospective reports on participants' past experiences with deja vu. And so I've selected a few here uh, to illustrate. Uh, in the first example, the participant said, everything she said, I knew she was going to say. Another participant stated, it almost feels like I am having a premonition. And finally, another participant described it as seeming like an old memory that they were in the middle of living out. Another more strange example of this association between deja vu and feelings of premonition comes from a paper by Mullen, Mullen and Penfield from back in 1959, where not only did these neurosurgeons manage to induce deja vu through neural stimulation during awake brain surgery, but they also seemed to induce a corresponding feeling of prediction. So the patient is quoted in this paper as saying, just a tiny flash of familiarity and a feeling that I knew everything that was going to happen in the near future, as though I had been through all this before and I thought I knew exactly what you were going to do next. Finally, a couple of years ago in my lab, we published a paper in Psychological Science demonstrating an empirical association between uh, deja vu and feelings of prediction. 
And what we had done in that study was build upon a paradigm that we had developed years earlier in my lab for the purpose of studying deja vu. In that paradigm, what we found was that if we put people in a scene that happens to be spatially uh, identical in spatial configuration to an earlier viewed but forgotten scene, people are more likely to report experiencing deja vu than when in a scene that doesn't resemble anything from earlier. So for example, when immersed in the scene on the right hand side of the screen, which is a doctor's office reception area, that scene, note that that maps spatially onto the scene on the left, which is an aquarium. So if a person had earlier experienced the aquarium, which is spatially identical in configuration, but doesn't remember that or doesn't recall that, they're more likely to experience deja vu in that right hand scene than if that right hand scene doesn't map onto anything from earlier. So uh, what we had done in our psychological science paper to examine the association between deja vu and uh, feelings of prediction was we really wanted to do something similar to what this survey participant had quoted. We wanted to try to put people in the middle of an ongoing memory, so to speak. And the way that we tried to achieve this was to use virtual tours. So the, the virtual tours are dynamic and unfolding. And so we created virtual tours from a first person perspective using the scenes from our prior research on deja vu. And so up on the screen is a bird's eye view perspective of the aquarium scene. And the yellow arrows indicate a particular navigational path that might be taken through that scene during the virtual tour. Note that it ends in a leftward going tone. Later on in the experiment then, the participant would view a virtual tour of an identically configured scene and that virtual tour would follow the same navigational path that had been followed in the earlier spatially identical scene but only up until a point. It would stop before a critical turn. So you can see it's stopping before that left word turn. And this was our method of trying to put people in the middle of a memory, so to speak, in the middle of an ongoing familiar scene. And the participants in our study had actually gone through dozens of virtual tours. And so they would view 16 different virtual tours in the encoding phase. And that phase would be followed by a test phase of 32 different virtual tours. Of those 32 virtual tours in a given block, half of those tours had the same spatial configuration and navigational path taken as an earlier tour from the encoding phase. And so in a test scene, so this is an example of that doctor's office reception area, when the test scene stops short of a turn, and in that doctor's office reception area, it stops right at these couches here, the participant starts to receive prompts. And the first prompt, uh, prompt in that uh, article was, uh, are you experiencing deja vu, yes or no? Followed by having the participant rate their feeling of knowing what the direction of the next turn should be, whether it should be left or right, on a scale of zero to 10, with 10 being definitely a very strong feeling of knowing, and zero being no feeling of knowing the direction of the next turn. Then they are, are to take a guess as to what the next turn should be. Should it be left or should it be right? And finally, they're asked if, if this scene reminds them of anything specific from earlier, because we're interested in, in when they don't recall it. So the correct answer here would be aquarium, because it maps onto the aquarium. Uh, and so uh, there were three notable findings here. And again, we're focusing on instances of retrieval failure when people can't recall the earlier tour. And the first finding was that deja vu was more likely in spatial, spatially similar scenes than in completely novel scenes. That was in replication of earlier work. The second finding was that deja vu was not associated with any actual predictive ability, even though we designed it to be possible for people to show memory-based predictive ability. When they couldn't recall, they didn't have an ability to predict and there was absolutely no association between feelings of deja vu and an ability to predict. Uh, people couldn't predict. But what was interesting was that during deja vu, people felt like they could predict. And so here's a graph depicting that from one of the experiments. As you can see here, when people report a deja vu state, they're giving significantly higher feeling of knowing the direction of the next turn ratings than when they're not reporting a deja vu state. And likewise, this was another experiment replicating that same finding. We've since replicated this pattern uh, in a number of experiments. And so the, the goal of my present talk is to focus on why this association between deja vu and feelings of prediction exists. 
One possibility is that people simply define deja vu in the first place as a feeling of prediction or a feeling of premonition. If so, then we really should see that nearly every single deja vu report is accompanied by a report of a feeling of prediction. But that's not what we find. When we break down people's deja vu reports, it's roughly just over half of their deja vu reports that are accompanied by a feeling of prediction. And so one approach that we've taken to try to better understand these instances is to examine, well, what tends to characterize these instances of deja vu reports that are accompanied by feelings of prediction? And one of the things we've been finding across studies is that these instances tend to have higher reported familiarity intensity than instances of deja vu reports that are not accompanied by a feeling of prediction. This is a graph uh, illustrating this from one particular study. Uh, and as you can see here, people were, had been asked to rate how intense the familiarity was as one of the prompts in this particular variation of that psychological science paradigm with virtual tours. And what you can see here is that among instances of deja vu reports that were accompanied by feelings of prediction, people tended to give higher ratings of familiarity intensity than among instances that were not accompanied by feelings of prediction. This is just another graph depicting the same general pattern, but from a slightly different experiment. Again, people are giving higher familiarity intensity ratings when uh, they report a feeling of prediction during deja vu than when they report not having a feeling of prediction during deja vu. So this had us wondering, does familiarity intensity actually drive feelings of prediction? These associations don't really tell us anything about the direction of causality. So to really start to get at that, what we needed was a direct experimental manipulation of familiarity. So we asked the question, does systematically increasing the familiarity level of the scenes themselves within the experiment also increase feelings of prediction or the likelihood of reporting a feeling of prediction? To achieve this, the method that we used was repetition. So we uh, repeated some of the virtual tours multiple times throughout the encoding phase. So for example, the aquarium on the top left, uh, that particular virtual tour might occur three different times throughout the encoding phase. At least in theory, the corresponding spatially identical scene, so in this case, the top right scene, the uh, doctor's office reception area, at least in theory, that scene should feel more familiar when its corresponding spatially identical scene had occurred three times than when it had occurred only once. And again, our focus is on when retrieval fails. So they fail to retrieve that aquarium, but it occurred three times. We're hypothesizing that that test scene will feel more familiar. Uh, than if the corresponding spatially identical scene had only been presented once. Likewise, or in turn, uh, a, a scene for which the spatially identical scene occurred once should still feel more familiar in line with past research than a scene that's completely novel and doesn't map onto anything from the encoding phase. So it was actually a new empirical question in and of itself whether this manipulation would actually work. Uh, that had never been shown and we had never actually explored it. It was a hypothesis that it should work in theory. And so one of the first aspects of the data that we needed to investigate was whether this manipulation was effective. Were these scenes uh, corresponding to uh, spatially identical scenes that had been repeated three times, were they actually more familiar than scenes that had their spatially identical scene only presented once. And indeed, as shown in this graph, uh, this is our manipulation check, the manipulation was effective. People were more likely to report uh, in a yes-no decision in this case uh, a feeling of familiarity for test scenes that corresponded to an unrecalled spatially identical scene that had occurred three times than one that had occurred only w once. So deja vu reports uh, also followed a similar pattern where the probability of reporting deja vu was also higher when the corresponding scene had occurred three times than when it had only occurred once. So turning to our primary question of interest then, would the probability of reporting a feeling of prediction regarding feelings of knowing that what the direction of the next turn should be, would that also increase with our familiarization method? It turns out it did. So the, this is the probability of reporting a feeling of prediction as a function of the scene familiar, familiarization manipulation. Again, with a focus on instances of recall failure. So our next question was, 
is it necessary to even ask people about deja vu in order to obtain this pattern? Or is there more of a direct relationship between familiarity and these feelings of prediction? So we carried out another variation of this experiment where well, the primary difference was we removed the deja vu prompt from trial to trial, and we had no mention of deja vu in this version. And so once again, the, familiar, the familiarization technique was effective. So people, again, reported that uh, scenes were more likely to report a sense of familiarity for test scenes that corresponded to three repeats from the, from the encoding phase than only one. Um, but once again, even without this deja vu prompt present and without a mention of deja vu, we still found this pattern here, whereby the increased familiarity of the test scene did seem to increase uh, the likelihood of a report of a feeling of knowing what the direction of the next term should be. So in conclusion, familiarity intensity appears to potentially play a role in future-oriented cognitive bias, or in this case, illusions of prediction. Basically, at least with these virtual tours and these, this type of scene familiarization that we've used, as you increase the level of familiarity, you also increase the likelihood of a report of a feeling of prediction. In terms of future directions, we're very interested now in exploring in what other situations does high familiarity intensity lead to illusions of prediction? And are there factors that increase or decrease reliance on familiarity as a cue for feelings of prediction? So for example, do people need to be oriented toward familiarity to use this in making a judgment about their feeling of prediction? And on that fir the note of that first bullet, I just want to give a shout out to my co-author, Kat White, who was recipient uh, of the Graduate Travel Award. I don't have time to get into the details of, of this particular line of work, but we're, we have recently been exploring the auditory version of Deja Vu, which is called Deja Entendu. And we've been using music as stimuli for investigating this. And it turns out Deja Entendu is also associated with illusory feelings of prediction, uh, such as stopping the music and having people in a Deja Entendu state feel like they, can, they know which direction the next note is going to come from. Uh, as one example. And so Kat is uh, giving her poster here at Psychonomics on this. And so I wanted to give a shout out since I don't have time to talk about this work. It's a very interesting line of work. So thank you very much. We have time for questions. Hi there. Hi. Uh, have you considered uh, looking at this in terms of like analogical problem solving? So showing problems and then showing a transfer problem to see if it, there's any kind of relationship there? Interesting that you mention that because I actually consider these stimuli to be analogies. These are spatial analogies. And so while we haven't looked at deja vu specifically or feelings of prediction yet with analogies, we have looked at a very similar type of phenomenon using analogy stimuli. And that phenomenon is presque vu. Presque vu is another vu uh, that uh, refers to uh, a feeling of being on the verge of an epiphany. Uh, and so we've actually used analogy, conceptual analogy stimuli to look at presque vu uh, feelings. And so it, in that regard we have, but not specifically with regard to feelings of prediction yet, but I think it's a great idea because these really are analogies uh, that we're using here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I was just wondering, and I may have missed it, what the um, time lag between uh, study and test were, because the previous um, speaker did mention that there's a lot of natural latency um, in these experiences, and I was wondering if um, you may expect some differences depending on how long between study and test you, uh, you look at mm -hmm. these. It's possible. We haven't looked at that yet. Um, so it's usually, for these virtual tour studies, approximately an hour to an hour and a half long where they're looking at tour after tour. Uh, and so it varies you know, from one given particular scene to another with the random ordering that we tend to use in our experiments. Um, it's possible that a longer delay could have an effect. It's not something that we've investigated yet between encoding and the retrieval phase. Thank you. Uh, hello. 
Um, so I was just wondering, how do you know that the experience that you're tapping into here is actually identical to the phenomenological experience of deja vu in real life mm -hmm. um, when there's no, I don't, I'm not aware of any evidence that you can induce deja vu. Mm -hmm. How do we know that we're not just looking into the experience of familiarity here? Mm -hmm. You know, I think th it's a great question. I don't think it's unique to this particular method. I mm -hmm. think um, it's it, the same issue comes up regardless of the approach taken to studying deja vu, whether it's a survey research, retrospective report, how do you know that people's memories for their past deja vu experiences are actually accurate and they're really recalling actual deja vu. Um, even among uh, brain stimulation patients or uh, people uh, who have chronic deja vu as a result of seizure activity, we still can't know, is that the real deja vu? And so I, I think it's not unique to this and it's also not unique to the topic of deja vu. I think if we look across cognitive psychology and the various topics that we study, we can always ask that question, is this selective attention, for example, the real selective attention that, that we find in the world, or is it sort of artificial from our laboratory method that we've used to try to create it? So I think it's a great question. I don't, th I don't think that it's really unique to uh, the experience of deja vu. Mm -hmm. Thank you. See. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our, our last speaker will, will be Neil Mulligan from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, before he starts, I just want to thank all of you for coming to this session. And I also want to big, give a big uh, thank you to the tech team back there who've made this uh, just uh, amazingly uh, unique experience. So, merci uh, de votre ad. All right, so I'm going to talk about divided attention uh, in a, under very special circumstances can enhance memory encoding. Um, we'll start with a couple of quotes, won't bother reading them, uh, take my word for it. Ebbinghaus said that if you pay more attention to a stimulus, you'll remember it better. And James said, if you don't pay attention to a stimulus, you won't remember it. So they said sort of mere images of the same idea. And this idea that attention is critical for long-term remembering uh, played an important role in modern, uh, the emergence of modern cognitive psychology uh, in things like Cherry's dichotic listening studies, uh, formalized in a theory in Broadbent's filter theory, attention resource models, and then somewhat more modern treatments like bottleneck models. All of these have very different ideas about what attention is and how we ought to think about attention, but they, in common, uh, argue about how important attention is for the formation of long-term memory traces. This idea uh, is well supported. Uh, distraction, as you know, uh, often impairs, typically impairs memory encoding. In the lab, we typically study this by comparing two conditions, a full attention condition, where subject's sole task is to try to encode information and remember it for later, and a divided attention or dual task condition where the subject is asked to do two things at once. They're encoding information to be remembered later and at the same time they're carrying out another task, uh, monitoring digits, monitoring tones, uh, dealing with another stream of stimuli in some way. And the completely unsurprising result of many studies is that the full attention condition produces better memory on subsequent memory tests. Given that very unsurprising result, the bulk of the research is not really so much focused on the mere fact that divided attention causes these negative effects on memory, but often it's examining precisely how these effects arise or looking for exceptions, what we might sometimes refer to as automatic uh, aspects of memory, automatically encoded features in memory. And these would be cases in which some element of memory uh, doesn't appear to be at least much harmed by distraction during encoding. Uh, for instance, uh, perceptual implicit memory, distraction during encoding, often produces uh, equivalent, roughly equivalent priming in a later memory test compared to the full attention condition. And if you look at distraction during memory retrieval, you often find that distraction produces little decrement to memory retrieval. But I always say things like little decrement or relatively little uh, change in performance on closer examination, even these automatic features in memory typically show some, at least some small, negative effect. So relatively, they're less affected, but absolutely, they're typically affected at least to some degree in a negative way by distraction. So it'd be a lot more surprising 
if we could find conditions under which divided attention actually enhances uh, memory encoding. One possible place to look for this is in the attentional boost effect. This is a phenomenon that was documented about nine years ago by Swallow and Jiang. And in this study, subjects were presented with a sequence of pictures, and they were told to try to remember these pictures for a later memory test. In addition, superimposed on each picture was a small square. This is out of proportion, big picture, little square. Uh, and the square was most of the time a black square, and occasionally there was a white square. Subject's task, try to remember the pictures, at the same time monitor the squares and respond. Hit a button, for instance, when you see the target square, the white square. So right now, we've just got a divided attention condition, a dual task condition, but we'll look at the results of that. Later, memory for the pictures is enhanced for the picture that occurred with the target from the detection task. Uh, it's higher than the other items. The other items are, roughly speaking, equal and lower uh, from, the, from the item uh, that was associated with the target. That difference they referred to as the att attentional boost effect. If we add a full attention condition, a single task condition, we get a little fuller picture of what's happening. The single task full attention are the uh, open circles, the white circles, and what you see first is that the full attention condition produces no uh, attentional boost effect. If you aren't paying attention to the little squares and responding to the target, you get no effect on later memory for the pictures. For the dual task version, you get the attentional boost effect. And two things to note, on average, there's a negative effect of divided attention. On average, the circles are higher than the little uh, triangles. However, uh, the target items in the distraction condition are boosted up to the level of the full attention condition. So the attentional boost, at least this version, is a relative boost, boosting the targets up to the level uh, obtained by the full attention condition. We examined this attention boost effect with verbal materials, with work with uh, Pietro Spataro and, and some other uh, colleagues. In this task, we presented words. Subjects were, gonna, were supposed to read the words and try to remember them for later. And below each word was a, a circle. The circle was either red or green, and the trial would look a little like that. They'd see the uh, dot just for uh, 100 milliseconds, and the word would be presented for maybe 600 or 700 milliseconds. Most of the time, the circle was green, and subjects were told to not worry about the green circles. Occasionally, the circle was red. Subjects were told, uh, you're searching for those red circles. Hit the space bar when you see the red circle, the target. Later on, people are given a memory test for the words, and in the divided attention condition, where you're doing both the detection task and trying to remember the words, we get a, a robust uh, attentional boost effect. The target words are remembered better than the distractor words. And in the full attention condition, when your sole task is try to remember the words, there no, there's no attentional boost effect. Also note that uh, the distractor items are less well remembered in the divided attention than in the full attention conditions, the normal dis negative effects of distraction, but the target items are boosted up to the level of the full attention items. So again, this version is a relative boost. The effect with verbal materials generalizes in several ways across study and test modalities, across at least a couple of memory tests. But there is a limiting condition which turns out to be important, uh, and that is the effect uh, is much smaller with low frequency words than with high frequency words. If we look just at the divided attention condition, high frequency items produce a robust attentional boost effect, and low frequency items uh, produce a much smaller one, sometimes non-significant, sometimes significant, but certainly smaller than with the high frequency items. That occurs with recognition, it occurs on a recall test. And it's going to be relevant because it's going to help us think about the basis of the attentional boost effect, especially with respect to what I'll talk about, the operative representations that underlie the effect. One aspect of these operative representations that I didn't emphasize earlier is that this effect emerges fairly quickly in terms of the processing of the stimulus. You can present stimuli every 500 milliseconds, every 700 milliseconds, and you get a nice robust attentional boost effect. So the operative representations must be encoded fairly quickly probably during the initial identification and comprehension of the stimulus. Alternatively stated, uh, it seems that the attention and boost effect 
is not uh, dependent on later uh, ongoing controlled post-comprehension rehearsal processes. We just noted the boost effect is larger for high frequency than low frequency words. Uh, and based on what I've just said, it's interesting to relate this to uh, a theory of the word frequency effects in memory, the elevated attention account, which makes a similar sort of distinction. The elevated attention account argues that low frequency words, which are more difficult to process initially, identify and comprehend, um, uh, initiate extended or um, uh, ad, uh, additional processing during comprehension and identification, which arguably has effects on later memory, so that the effects of word frequency are during the early phase encoding comprehension processes and not on late phase controlled elaborative processing. So perhaps the attentional boost manipulation is largely redundant with the sort of processing that spontaneously occurs with low frequency stimuli. If that's the case, then the attentional boost effect should be due to this early phase encoding as well. And consequently, it should arise even with very brief presentation times. It shouldn't increase with increasing study durations because increasing study durations gives you more time for late phase controlled processing. But identification comprehension processes, certainly for individual words, are occurring in a few hundred milliseconds. The relationship between a typical divided attention effect is that we believe that these divided attention effects that we normally see are effects on the controlled rehearsal processes. The late phase encoding is disrupted by distraction, a typical dual task interference. Normally, those targets in the studies I've just shown you are boosted up to the full attention level, implying that the boost in early phase encoding can offset, roughly speaking, the penalty one gets for doing two tasks at the same time. But if we were to give people very long presentation times, long being multiple seconds here, then eventually the divided attention deficit uh, to late phase encoding should perhaps come to swamp uh, the uh, positive effects of early phase encoding. So if you give people a lot of time, uh, even the divided, even the targets will be below the full attention condition. So you're wondering right now, what does that have to do with distraction not impairing memory as opposed to impairing it? Uh, we'll see that in just a minute after this first, after this, uh, first experiment. So in the first experiment, uh, we have the two types of distractor and uh, target trials. And we varied across groups the presentation duration, study duration, 700 milliseconds, 1.5, and 4 seconds. All of those were in the divided attention condition, read the words and monitor the dots. And then two full attention control conditions just at the extreme, 700 milliseconds and 4,000 milliseconds. Next, we'll see a kind of complicated graph, so I'll quickly walk you through it. In the full attention condition, these two dots here and everything is overlaid right there, uh, the targets and distractors in the full attention condition produce equal performance as we'd expect. In the divided attention, we get a robust uh, attention boost effect. The red line is higher than the blue line. And importantly, the attention boost is uh, prominent from the earliest, shortest study duration. And it doesn't get any larger with longer study durations, right? If anything, it's getting smaller. But it doesn't get any larger, certainly. And then finally, for a, very, for a short duration, the boost boosts the target items up to the level of the full attention condition. But if you give people fairly lengthy study trials, then the targets are not boosted up to that level. Full attention uh, is superior to even the targets in this experiment. So robust attentional boost effects when people are responding to the dots, when they're monitoring the, the dots. No attentional boost when you're not responding to them in the full attention condition. The boost effect appears early and uh, does not increase with increasing presentation time. And then finally, the relationship between the targets and the full attention. Equal at 700 milliseconds, but the targets have a deficit at uh, four seconds. Consistent with the notion that the effect of presentation time is due to increased late phase elaborative encoding, and full attention gets more and more benefit of late phase uh, elaboration uh, as you have more and more time to engage in that kind of controlled rehearsal process. This analysis predicts that long study times should produce a net divided attention, negative divided attention effect, even for the targets. 
but it also predicts that very, very short study durations should produce a net positive effect for divided attention uh, for those targets in this task. The idea here is that the early phase advantage would still obtain, as long as people have time to identify and comprehend the stimulus, the early phase advantage would persist, but there'd be little time for late phase encoding, so little dual task penalty for those target items. And this would be in stark contrast to the usual effects of distraction on later memory. So we have two conditions, full and divided attention, a very brief study time, I can't see what that number says, but it's not much, but that's okay. Um, very brief study time of 400 milliseconds. Both conditions, of course. And in the full attention, uh, the final test is a yes-no recognition test. In the full attention condition, uh, the targets and distractors are equally well remembered, so no attentional boost effect in the full attention condition. Performance is relatively low. You didn't have much time to learn these items. And in the divided attention condition, we get a robust attentional boost effect. And most critically, the target items, there it is, the target items in the divided attention condition are not only higher than the distractor items in that condition, they're also higher than the full attention condition. So as we've seen before, robust attentional boost effect in the DA condition, but not in the full attention condition. And with very short study times, you end up getting a net positive effect of distraction this particular type of distraction on later memory. In experiment two, we reduce the influence of late phase encoding during the study phase, during encoding itself, by giving people very little time to encode the items. We can also uh, imagine trying to, uh, trying to limit the effects of late phase encoding uh, during retrieval. Perceptual implicit tests, largely speaking, is a memory domain in which performance is dominated by early phase study and uh, comprehension and identification processes, and it's relatively little affected by late phase controlled processing. If the attentional boost effect affects uh, early phase encoding, uh, and dual task effects largely impair late phase encoding, then we ought to see an absolute uh, attentional boost in this domain as well. So we did the experiment. Uh, with two different perceptual implicit tests. First with lexical decision, and here you're seeing the priming measure on the y-axis. And what you can see is that the targets produced more priming than the divided attention distractors, the attentional boost, and more so than the full attention conditions, so an absolute boost for those particular items. Same result obtains for word fragment completion. These are just two examples of commonly used implicit tests uh, that demonstrate you get consistent results uh, at least across a couple of these implicit tests. So the attentional boost effect, just to kind of summarize things, refers to heightened memory for material that co-occurs with a target during a detection task, during the detection task. And it appears that it's due to enhanced early phase encoding during the initial identification or comprehension of the stimulus. Consistent with that, it doesn't increase, the attentional boost effect doesn't increase with additional presentation time. If anything, whoops, let's see, there's a back button, right? There we go. If anything, it reduces in size. In my study, it was not significant. But if anything, it's not increasing. If anything, it's reducing in size. Uh, and perhaps that indicates that early phase effects might eventually be swamped as people have more and more time to engage in late phase controlled rehearsal processes. This analysis indicates you can even produce a situation where distraction during encoding uh, enhances later memory rather than impairs it. And this occurs if the influence of this late phase controlled encoding is greatly diminished. Then the enhancement to early phase encoding can be demonstrated and produce a net positive effect relative to the full attention. This can be done at encoding with very brief presentation times. It can be done at retrieval using tests that are largely insensitive to late phase encoding. And in general, this points to the utility of uh, examining more closely this general distinction between early phase and late phase encoding. It maps on to a few other effects, uh, and it's been uh, proposed in a few limited areas and for a few limited effects in memory research. Uh, but this analysis, uh, to me at least, makes it uh, something that seems like it's worthy a little more, uh, a little more research. Uh, and then, I actually still have any time? Yeah. 
one minute, okay. Um, and then I'll just uh, literally simply mention that there are a couple of other examples of distraction enhancing uh, memory. Um, I'm trying to accumulate some additional ones. Uh, one is very closely related to what I've just talked about. The attentional boost manipulation has been used in visual short-term memory studies. Uh, and one can demonstrate this sort of absolute benefit in the, for the target items in a visual working memory task. And then a little far, a little more, uh, a little more removed from what we've talked about, is there are cases where you can uh, engage in retrieval-induced forgetting paradigm, uh, where distraction can produce ultimately a net benefit to at least some of the encoding conditions. In particular, if you distract people during the retrieval practice phase in retrieval-induced forgetting, uh, you can do away with retrieval-induced forgetting. And the way it's done away with is the control condition, the baseline condition actually improves. It, it uh, significantly, can, can significantly improve. So distraction while you're engaging in practice with some of the items can have a net benefit to your memory for the other items. So a somewhat different but another positive effect, absolute positive effect of distraction. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. We have time for about one question. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciated that talk. Um, so there, there's some, I think, recent evidence that um, ABE can enhance relational memory for like task irrelevant background information, as well as uh, recollection. Um, and it's thought that those sort of contextually rich representations can take some time to encode. Right. So I just wonder if this early phase account would predict that you would get that full extent, that you know, contextual information boost with these very brief sure. um, encoding durations. So you also probably know that there's also some other results that, that indicate that the attentional boost can enhance memory for the item, but not some contextual details for the item. Um, and then there's some other studies that indicate that if you're testing people's memory for the relation between the item and the item from, and the um, target from the detection task, that you can see benefit in there. Uh, and so actually, I, I don't know how, what to make of those results together. Um, and I mean, it's an important thing to think about, but I don't, I don't have any, any answer at all for you right now, other than to say that there seem to be some conflicting results about whether it enhances relational information or exactly perhaps what type of relational information it enhances and whether we ought to consider that to be controlled post-comprehension elaboration processes. My bet is those things still happen pretty quickly. Um, and so uh, the idea of these early phase encoding may have to be expanded if, to make better sense of that but I just don't have a good, uh, a good handle on exactly how these things should all be meshed together at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all for your attentional boosts, and uh, thank you for the session. <laughs>